It seems normal to me that Christians would wonder about the meaning of the transfiguration. In case you don't know by now, it is Transfiguration Sunday in the lectionary year. And even when we come to understand what happened there on the side of the mountain, on the hillside, we might wonder still if it's important enough to merit its own Sunday in our liturgical calendar. I believe it is because this is a moment in the history of God with the people of God when God did something very intentional, when God stepped out of the box and implemented an intervention that involved the Son of God and the people of God. And when we read about this mysterious event, about one that is hard to explain and about one that both had meaning to those in whose time it occurred and still has meaning to us today, we can't help but explore it again, even though we explore it every year. And as I've been reflecting this week on transfiguration and what that means, I really have boiled it down for myself at least, and therefore for us this morning, to two questions that I think we can answer together this morning. First, how are we in 2014 going to allow the divine revelation reflect change in us and around us? How are we going to allow God's divine revelation to reflect a change in us and around us? And second, how does our own experience of holiness, of the divine presence of God, become witness to God's light and God's presence in us? So in a nutshell, how do we experience it? And then second, how do we reflect it in our lives? So let Let's think about that together this morning and some mountain stories during our time together. Would you pray with me? God, we know the value of studying your word, the Bible, over and over again, and we know the experience of it speaking to us in new and wonderful ways each time we look at it. And so we ask you during this time this morning to make yourself known to us, to speak to us through this transfiguration, and to inspire us to both transform and transfigure our lives and the lives of those around us as we experience a direct intervention from God together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you might know the story already, but let me remind you. Jesus and a few of his disciples, what we might call Jesus' inner circle, go to a private place on a hillside. We are immediately reminded back in Exodus, in the life of Moses, of a very similar experience where Moses went up as recorded in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus and the disciples, or I love this phrase in the NRSV this week, are quite alone. That means they're completely alone. Jesus and the disciples were quite alone, as this morning's gospel emphasizes, and right before their very eyes, remember that song, right before their very eyes, they experienced a change in Jesus. His face began to shine like the sun, the Bible says, and his clothes became as white as white light. And lo and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared from the dead in the grave, talking to Jesus in a very conversational style. Hey, how you doing? How are things going? How's your mama and them? How are things going at work? How, how are these disciples doing? I know they're challenging. And then a bright cloud. Now, that's unusual. Now, don't we in Florida usually know dark clouds? But the Bible says a bright cloud, unusual to us, but the bright cloud overshadows Jesus. And the voice of God is heard saying, and you know this quote, we all say we want to hear it, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
Listen to him. And those are the important words for us this morning, which we often overlook. Those last three words, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And so I have the first message for you this morning. This is Jesus. Listen to him. Amen. Amen. Well, just as sure as I am that that the disciples would have been, I got to tell you, I would have been scared, slammed to death, as my southern relatives would say. I don't blame them for falling on their feet, on their backs, and hiding their eyes, and putting their faces in the sand, because I would have been scared too. But I love the way Jesus comes up to them and puts his hand on their shoulder. It doesn't really tell us where Jesus put his hand, but it says he touched them. I imagine it like a nurturing shepherd on the shoulder. And he said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be scared. And when they opened their eyes after all of this wonderful divine drama, they were suddenly alone with Jesus again. Things were as they had been, and everything had become new. Isn't that a wonderful thing that God does for us? That things can be as they have been, and at the same time, everything can become new. And so I could spend the rest of the morning interpreting this mountain story for you. We could compare and contrast it as we've all done in college but to the Moses experience in the Hebrew Bible and how it relates to the Jesus experience in the New Testament and how important it really was that Moses and Elijah, out of all the characters in the Old Testament, showed up and were having this conversation. And it really would be very interesting. I promise it would. But I want to keep it simple this morning and simply stated that important things happen when we are on mountains. When we are on the mountain, important things happen in our lives. And we know it throughout the scripture, both the Old Testament and the New, that any time somebody went up a mountain, we could look out because God was about to do something in their lives. And we've all known these experiences too, where we've gone to a retreat or we've gone to a church camp or sometimes even on vacation or for me, even like going to training for three days. I can Come back excited and lifted up, and I have a mountaintop experience that, as you're seeing this morning, I can't help but share with you, even if it means taking out cell phones, amen, because I'm excited about it. I really believe they have it right that we want people to know we're here and that we want to know this choir singing beautifully. And whatever you might say about the preacher, I'll leave that up to you. But we want people to know that we are alive and well and that things are happening here and that the God on the mountain can be depended on, but I just got to say for one minute too, that I know that people in this congregation struggle. I know people struggle to make ends meet. I know some people struggle with health issues and emotional health issues, and God knows it's hard to pay the electric bill, especially when you're under the auspices of GRU, amen. They got some high prices around here, and the gas pumps are higher here than anywhere else, and so it causes us to struggle. But here's the good news this morning. The God on the mountain is still the God in the valleys too. The God on the mountain picks us up in the valleys and lifts us up and transfigures us all over again. And I just love that old gospel song that says, The God on the mountain is still God in the valleys. Can I get a witness in here this morning? We know that God is faithful beyond anything we could even dream or think of. We know that God has brought us too far to abandon us right here where we are. And we also know that there is hope no matter what happens in the family of God. And I'm here to prophesy this morning in the name of Jesus that this church and all of us together are headed up another mountain with Jesus. We have come too far to turn 
turn back now. And I'm convinced as much as I ever been, have been that God does have a plan for this church and that God has a plan for my life and your life and all of us together. And I stand here this morning in this pulpit to proclaim in the name of Jesus that we have a transfiguration, a transformation in store for us is going to rock our world if we are faithful Amen. and willing to do the work to dream yes. all over again and to honestly, prayerfully, mindfully discern what God's will is for us. It will not be my vision. It should not be the board's vision or the deacon's vision or anybody else's individual or group vision. It must be God's vision. Amen. Amen. And I just know that God is going to show it to us. So you might ask, how are we going to allow this divine reflection, this divine revelation to show forth in us? We agreed together nearly five years ago that the way we would do it is by spreading the message of God's inclusive love. Now, I have to say for us, we have done a very good job with that mission statement. It's on the website. It's on Facebook. It's on your bulletin this morning. It's in the Friday Reminder. It's in the eTalk. It's on everything we ever published. It might even be on that Vicki Shaw poster back there, but I'm not sure. It should be if it's not. But we've done a very good job for that. However, five years is a long time for a mission statement. It's a very long life. And so I think it's time for us to get together again around some tables with some snacks and some drinks and to revision God's mission for our church and to at least tweak our mission statement and make sure it's the right one. And if it's not exactly right, it's time for us to write a new one. Amen. Amen. We need to answer this question. To what purpose are we called and by what method are we called to get there? Where will all of this take place and who will lead this transformation which God is promising us today? But in order to capture it, we got to spend some time together intentionally doing it all over again because I believe with all my heart that God is calling us to transfer transformation by looking carefully and honestly at these five years that we've spent together and to compare them to the history of our church for the first 35 or 25 years before that. What are our successes and what are our challenges? How can we really reflect the divine presence of God that is at work in us? And once again, I am just convinced that we can't do this apart from each other. We're going to have to come back in the room together and work on it together. And more than just a few of us, by the way, but most of us are going to have to come here and reflect on our recent history and compare it to our past history and to really look and see what God is seeking to do among us to make us even better witnesses, better love, better light, better reflections of the one who we claim to follow as followers of Jesus. In answer to the second question, how does our own experience of holiness become witness to God's light and presence in us? I'm also convinced that there is a process that we can use to find the answer to that question. And so, as your pastor this morning, I'm calling us as a church all the way back to July of 2009 when I arrived here. We started a process at that time that I really believe in. I know that the process works if we work it because I've seen it in so many churches so many times 
over and over again. And so over the next months, we will be working together to come to terms with our history, yours and mine and the other 25 years of Trinity MCC. We will discover Trinity MCC's identity all over again. Who are we today and who is it that God's calling us to be in our future together, yours and mine? We will discover that we will negotiate leadership change. And I'm going to tell you this morning boldly that there must be leadership change. It has to happen, whatever that means for us. One thing I know about this church, and I say this in love, and you don't have to guard yourself like we did with my grandmother when she would say that, but it is true, absolutely true, that there are way too few people in this church carrying way too much of the responsibility. That should be a loud amen. Amen. There are just a few people in this congregation who are making everything happen, and we can't survive that way. And it's going to be necessary for us to do two things. Number one, we're going to really have to give permission for some of these people who've been doing it for 30 years to take a little step back. Honestly, some of them are very tired. Some of them would love to retire or at least take a break. But what that means is, and I'm looking at some faces this morning, that we're going to have to make room for some new leaders to both come forward and be empowered to lead us. Now, don't let this scare you. I don't, I'm willing to be part of that. I may be the pastor of this church for the next five years, or we might really discover together that God has somebody else in mind. Maybe five years is long enough. And I want to say that to you and say at the same time that I'm not threatening to leave. I'm not interviewing for a job. Just because I took training that's labeled interim pastor doesn't mean I'm going to be somebody's interim pastor. And I am willing, as I said to Jess this morning, wherever I said she, because you know I like to play with gender, I said Wherever she leads, I'll go. How about you? Maybe God is leading you into leadership. Maybe God is leading you into retirement. Maybe, and I will confess to you that I'm in serious discernment about this, Maybe God intends for Al and me to be here for another five years. And maybe there's another congregation that needs us. Mm -hmm. And it's not scary. Because we're not looking for my mission or my vision or even your mission and your vision. We must find God's plan for Trinity MCC, including leadership. Mm -hmm. Now take a deep breath. I know I just scared you to death, but (laughs) you'll process it, watch it online, hear it all over again, exactly what I said. I'm not saying I'm leaving, but I am saying wherever God leads, we must go. Are you with me this morning? And so we're going to be very intentional about this. We're going to renew our, we're going to learn about our history together. We're going to uh, recruit some new leaders and let some people who need to and want to have a break, have a break. We're going to even further connect to what MCC is doing around the world. And we're really going to be MCC and be love and be justice and be all that God is calling our denomination to be. And finally, when we get there, we will know, because the process works if we work it, we will know what God's direction is for this church. And that, my sisters and brothers, will lead to transfiguration and transformation all over again. Now hear me very carefully. 
I'm really serious. This is not going to be easy. It's going to be scary. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to be some of the most challenging work a pastor and a congregation ever do together to get honest about things. Amen? Amen. Not comfortable. But we're going to do it. And when we work the process and it has worked, we will have mountain stories to tell. We will have been up some mountains. We'll be singing that old gospel song, the God on the mountain, who brings us through every valley and every hill and everything about us will be transformed and transfigured and make more in the image of God who has called us all together. And those will be our mountain stories. Now, I don't need a prophet hat for this. I can tell you from experience. The measure of our potential success will be the number of people, you, who fully participate in the process. There is no doubt. If I have the same people in that room that show up here for every other thing we do here and carry the board in every day of the week and nobody else, it'll fail. Yep. The measure of our potential success will be the number of you who fully participate in the process because the process works when you work it. Will you Amen. do it? Yes. Are you up for the challenge to yes. do it again, to capture what's God's plan, God's direction, for us as a people of faith, together as Trinity Metropolitan Community Church of Gainesville Incorporated. Are you willing? Yes. And are you ready? Are you willing to do very difficult work to be transformed, transfigured, made more in the image of God, to more deeply reflect the divine presence of God that was reflected on us and is now to be reflected through us. I trust you. I believe in you. And I know that this is what God is calling us to on March 2nd, 2014. I'm sure of it. So will you do it? Yes. God bless you this morning. And also Amen. You.